After the tone, please state your name, followed by the pound key. I'm sorry, we did not get your name. After you state your name, please press the pound key. I'm sorry, we did not get your name. After you state your name, please press the pound key. If you talk to a patient, what is it that they complain about? That gives you a start for identifying your problem. Another big thing to do is just to listen to the voice of the customer. That's really, really important. It doesn't matter who they are. It's what do they want from the service that you're providing? What do they want from you? And what are they expecting from you? Another way to identify if something might be a problem to look into is does it relate to some of the QCDSM framework? So is something unreliable in your process? Is something really cost inefficient? Does it affect safety? So when you're determining what the problem is, it's important not to move to action immediately. Have you actually gone to see what the problem is yourself? Did you go to the Gemba? Do you have some baseline data that shows it's a problem? And have you done a bit of a root cause analysis? Have you gone out there and asked those five whys? So once you've identified your problem and you're, you've done a bit of legwork to determine that it's actually something you want to tackle, the next part of step number one is to set your goal. So this really doesn't need to be complicated. So it's really, what do you want to achieve? Just make it clear and make it public so that your team, the pe your people, your stakeholders, really whoever, knows what you're working on and what you're trying to accomplish. And I think the best way to do this is to come up with a goal statement. So the tool I like to use for that is the SMART goal. So it's an acronym and it stands for the following. So S is be specific. It's about being clear and really unambiguous in what you're measuring. Make it very, very clear. The M is for measurable, so how much, how many, is it possible to collect the necessary data? That's all about the measurement part of it. A is for aspirational, so set yourself a goal that's aggressive, but still realistic, otherwise it's kind of meaningless. You need to set your aim high enough so that it requires some commitment in order to achieve it. You need to set a goal that's relevant, so choose something that matters. Is there something in it for the patient? Is there something in it for the staff? Is it gonna be worthwhile? Does the effort needed match the need? And then finally, the T is for, is it time bound? What timeline is reasonable? And how would you know that? So today I'm gonna to use a, a pretty basic example to run you through how this process can be accomplished. So here's a look at the current me on the left-hand side. I'm a rec league hockey player that wants to go from being the guy on the left to this guy on the right. So the problem that I'm facing is, well, really that my skill level isn't where I'd like it to be. I want our team to win championships, and in order for that to happen, I need to be a better hockey player. So if I know what my problem is, that we're not winning championships, I can set my goal. So if I want to be a better hockey player, the goal that I might set could be this one. So I'm going to look for a little bit of feedback here. Do you think this is a good goal based on what a smart goal statement would be like? Nope. <laughs> I would agree with you. Final answer? <laughs> yeah, I would tend to agree with you. This, I mean, it's okay, but it's kind of more like a mission statement. It's measurable. I could tell if I'm the top scorer in the league, but it's not overly specific, and it's really got no time attached to it. So, no, it's not a great statement. What about this one? That sounds like a hope. <laughs> that does sound like a hope. So again, it's not a great goal statement because it's just way too broad. There's no specificity to it. What about this one? I'm going to assume you're all saying yes, that's yes. great. <laughs> so, yes, this statement that's great, Doug. <laughs> this, is, this is much better because it's time sensitive, it's measurable, and it's specific. So that's what I'm going to choose as my goal. 
So that's the first step about determining what your problem is and setting a goal. So the second step is about developing your indicators. What are you going to measure? And just a quick side note that you may hear something called an indicator, you may hear something called a measure. They're not different things, they're exactly the same thing. So they can be used fairly interchangeably. I'll do my best not to do that, but if you hear me say different things, just know that I do mean the same thing. So in indicator development, it's really about going from a concept to a measure. And sometimes that can be really easy. So if your goal is to reduce the number of medication errors, it's pretty clear to figure out what you want to measure. You want to measure medication errors. But sometimes it can be pretty difficult too. So if you're trying to improve patient safety, there's all kinds of different things you could look at. So one way that you can really make indicator development easier is to ensure that you've got a really good goal statement. If that's the case, then measures usually become apparent pretty quickly. So when you're starting to think about what you're going to measure, it's important to note that measures tend to be considered in a family of measures and not really just as standalone entities. So a group of measures can be looked at within a framework that we use here in Saskatchewan of an outcome measure, a process measure, and a balancing measure. There are also patient experience measures, but depending on what you're looking at, these could actually fall into any one of those other three categories, but it's important to note that they definitely exist. So the first type of measure, it's the outcome measure. It's what's going to show you if you're achieving your goal statement. And the factors that affect it are usually pretty complex and can be quite numerous, so it might take a significant amount of time to see a change in its value. So for example, a healthcare outcome measure might be the Kai Hai Hospital Harm Indicator. It measures the occurrences of harm in hospital facilities. So it's an outcome measure for the provincial goal of having zero preventable injuries to staff or patients by 2020. So uh, just a quick side note, some of you might be familiar with the terminology of a lagging measure, and that's just another name for what an outcome measure is. It's called a lagging measure because it tends to change a little bit slowly. The next type of measure is the process measure. And these are the things that if these improve, then the outcome measure should improve as well. So they're used to measure the processes which affect the outcome. Sounds simple. These are usually act actionable, and if improvement work like a PDCA cycle, is done, then there should be an immediate effect on this measure if the change actually had an effect. So just again another note, if you've heard the term a lagging measure for outcome, then this is a leading measure as a process measure. So if you've heard those terminologies, just know these are the same things. So the third category of measure is the balancing measure. And this is a really important thing to consider because these are the measures that can show you if there's unintended consequences to the changes that you've made. Balancing measures don't have to be a numerical thing either. They can be comments or stories, really anything. Anything that'll shed light on the other areas that might be affected by the changes that you're implementing. So here's a pretty simple example to highlight why balancing measures are so important. Currently, there's a provincial initiative that's looking at reducing the length of stay in the emergency departments. So if the outcome measure shows that there's been a reduction in time spent in the emergency department, that would definitely be a good thing. However, if there was lots of patients coming back to the emergency department because they were receiving less thorough care, well, that's kind of the opposite of what the goal is trying to achieve, so that would be a bad thing. So that's why we have a provincial balancing measure of readmissions within 30 days of treatment. So this enables the ED wait team to see if the work they're doing is having an adverse effect on something else. I'm just going to pause there. Um, we're hearing some feedback uh, on the line. I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind star six in order to mute your phone. Thanks. Thanks, Tanya. So, on that note, it's time for a quick pop quiz, which I know you all really appreciate on Friday morning. So, let's pretend that we're all working together and our goal is to reduce the incidence of pressure ulcers. So, I've got a list of measures here and I'd like you to tell me if you think they're an outcome measure, a process measure, or a balancing measure. First one. Again, we are seeing, hearing some pretty good feedback on the line, so if you wouldn't mind muting, that, that would be great. But unmute when you answer this question. <laughs> um, so the first one is percentage of staff repositioning residents with reduced mobility at least every four hours. Do you think that's an outcome measure, a process measure, or a balancing measure? Process measure. Perfect. Why would you think that? Well, because it's specific to the task. Yep. No, I would say that's a perfect answer, and it's correct. What about this second one? You know, barriers are. Oh, So it's the monthly incidence of resident pressure ulcers. Do we have thoughts on if it's an outcome measure, a process measure, or a balancing measure? Outcome. I would agree. 
I mean, basically our goal is to reduce pressure ulcers. So this would have fallen right out of that statement. We want to measure the number of pressure ulcers. What about the next one? Percentage of back injuries among staff. Balancing measure. I would agree. That might be one of the unintended consequences that we could have if we're asking our staff to move patients more. Perhaps that's harder on them and perhaps they're getting hurt, so we want to make sure that isn't happening. And then the last one, the patient satisfaction with the care provided. Again, what do you think? Process, outcome, or balancing? Balancing. Again, I agree. So you guys, you guys are 100%, so you, you pass on your Friday morning. Yeah, we, just, we want to make sure that patients are still happy even though we've made a change. So we want to make sure that their experience hasn't been worsened. So something that's pretty common to hear when people go to select measures is the, well, I, I just don't know what to measure. So some advice that I've heard pretty commonly that I just want to mention today is that if you don't really know what you should measure, then you should maybe go back to that first step and dig a little bit deeper into the problem and make sure that you really understand the root cause to determine what processes might affect it. And then if you understand that, then you should have a pretty good handle on what you're going to measure. So, I mean, really, how do you go from knowing what your problem and goal are to determining what you can measure? There's a couple things that I'd like to put out there that you can think about. The first is to look at what does your goal statement say? So is there anything obvious that falls out of that goal statement? And that's usually a pretty good place to start. Uh, the next thing you can think about are what processes affect the outcome. So can you measure those processes? For example, if your outcome measure is the time spent in the emergency department, perhaps a process measure might be the time from when the patient walks in until they see a physician. If you can improve that process, then you would likely see improvement in the outcome measure. So when you're starting to determine what you're going to measure, it's important not to do it in seclusion. Just don't do it by yourself. Use your team, use other stakeholders, run it as past anybody that will be involved in the process. The more input you get, the more likely you are to have a strong set of measures. So a tool that can be pretty useful in do developing measures is a driver diagram. So I won't dive into that today, but there's lots of good resources out there and there's several knowledgeable people in this Kaizen community that would be really good contacts for more information on how to use a driver diagram. Another thing you could do is, if you want to practice determining what indicators are, I'm going to plug kaizantracker.ca. So go on there, pick a random event, look at the title and think through what might be the outcome measure for that, what might be a process measure, can I think of a balancing measure. It's an easy way to start, to start learning this practice. And then if you wanted, you could check the team's target sheet and see if what you picked was similar to what they picked. So here's a bit of a healthcare example that show, runs you through some thinking on how an indicator can be selected. So imagine that our goal is to reduce the number of patients that are hospitalized because of the six ambulatory care sensitive conditions. And those are people that have diabetes or coronary artery disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, heart failure, depression, or asthma. So if these people aren't in the hospital, then they are likely healthier. So that's what we want to happen. So if our goal is to reduce the number of those people in the, in the hospital, selecting our outcome measure, I'd want to figure out what would show if we're meeting our goal. So to me, this does seem pretty obvious. We want to measure the number of people that are hospitalized due to those six conditions. And that falls right out of that goal statement. So that's how I would go about choosing the outcome measure. For selecting a process measure, I'd want to look at what work could be done that might affect my outcome. So let's say that we're all experts and we know there's research that says if a patient with one of those conditions is treated properly according to care guidelines, then there's a much better chance that they're going to stay sort of vertical and healthy instead of laying horizontal in a hospital bed. So if that was the case, we might select a process measure like this. The proportion of patients with any of these conditions being treated according to the care guidelines. I would choose this because if there's more patients being treated properly, it should affect my outcome measure. And that's how I would go about looking at my process measure. So now if I want to think about what might be a balancing measure for that, it's what would be, what could I look at that would show that there's no negative or unintended consequences associated with the work that we're going to do for these ACSC patients? So in doing some thinking, I'd want to make sure that our ACSC patients are getting the correct care, but I would also want to make sure that the rest of the population is also getting good care. So to monitor that, I might be looking at appointment times and seeing if my third next available appointment time has changed. This might show me that I'm spending so much time with my ACSC patients that my other patients can't get in in a timely fashion for their appointments. That would be the balancing measure that I'd look at. So that's just a quick example of how you might think through making measures for healthcare. But 
If you remember, the story I'm going to walk you through was my goal was to go from being a scrub hockey player to basically being Mario Lemieux. So, that, I mean, I get that that's not entirely realistic, but the, the goal we created is. It's aspirational, yet it is achievable. So if I think about what the measurement framework is of outcome, process, and balancing measures, what are your thoughts on some things that I could measure? What do you think might be my outcome? So I'll leave that to the audience for a suggestion if they've got any. I'll give you a hint. If you look at the goal statement, it should fall out of it. All right, we're all a little shy this morning, but that's okay. So for this, I would say my outcome measure is my total points. It seems to come right out of that goal statement, so that's what I would say my outcome measure is. As for my process measure, so this is where I want to start thinking about what process or what action might determine the total amount of points that I get. So since you're all a little shy this morning, I'm just going to keep going. But if you've got any other thoughts, I'd be happy to hear them, because perhaps it would have been better if I'd done this collaboratively. So here's what I was thinking for process measures. So the first is goals scored, so the number of times that I'm going to put the puck in the net, assists, the number of times I passed to someone else who put the puck in the net, and my time spent practicing. And I chose these because I feel pretty confident about the fact that if I'm able to either improve my goals or my assists, or if I spend more time practicing, I'll score more points, which in turn will make me a better hockey player, which will help achieve my overall outcome of winning a championship. So the next thing, obviously, in that measurement framework is to think about what might be a good balancing measure for this. So I need to think about what I could measure that would affect my process, be affected by my process and outcome measures. So the first thing I thought about measuring was the possibility of looking at the number of goals scored by the other team when I'm on the ice, because that might show that I'm the only person trying to score and I'm not playing any defense. So maybe I'm actually hurting my team instead of helping them. But when I thought through this a little bit more, I thought that it's probably the person that's most affected by the amount I'm choosing to play hockey would be my girlfriend. So I settled on this as the measure for my presentation today. <laughs> my balancing measure is the number of nights that I get to spend sleeping on the couch. Um, so it's kind of important, and I want to note that I could have selected several different balancing measures, and in a real-life situation, I might have. However, for today, I'm just going with one to keep things fairly simple. So here's what it would look like if I aligned my measures in a measurement framework. I would have my total points at the top. You can see it's affected by my goals, assists, and time spent practicing, and my balancing measures underneath on the, as the time spent on the coach. Quick fun fact, it kind of looks like a driver diagram if you turn it sideways. I'm just a driver diagram. Way to figure out what you're going to measure. So that's the end of the first section. Uh, are there any questions so far? Just keeping in mind that this is a pretty basic overview, so we're not going to delve too deep into anything. Hello, this is Leanne from SHIPS. We've got a group of us dialed in here. Um, I was just thinking, and as we were talking here as a team in the background, I think it's, um, we can use A3 thinking or encourage the use of A3 thinking to help us uh, better get down to our problems and goal, goal statements. Yeah, this is Tanya. That's a great suggestion. And just to build on that, on the right-hand side of your A3, so uh, Doug talked about the use of driver diagrams, and that's something I've seen being used more and more on that right-hand side in terms of countermeasure section. Um, and out of that driver diagram really will come what you should be focusing on for your outcome and process measures. So yeah, I think that's Absolutely. a nice suggestion. Yeah. We're on the same page for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. All right, so now that the first section's over, we're going to move on into the, the second section, which is all about data collection. So let's go do it then. Let's say that we all work together and we're going to go collect some data. And we're working on a goal of reducing the number of occurrences for pneumonia in patients that are on ventilation. This is a fairly common problem, unfortunately, so it's something we want to work on. So if this is what our goal is, I think our outcome statement becomes pretty clear. We want to measure the number of patients developing pneumonia while they're on ventilation. Makes sense. Again, let's assume we're all experts, so we know that there's a best practice out there, and that's that the head of the bed should be elevated. So perfect. That kind of gives us what our process measure should be. And that might be, we want to measure the number of beds that are elevated, because we know if we measure that, 
then that might affect our outcome. So that's, that's a good thought. So I'm going to ask you to go out and audit the number of beds that are elevated. So you walk around and you see this bed. Okay, so that's perfect. Here's my bed. It's not elevated. Put an X to that one. Then you see a bed that looks like this. So is that elevated? You walk to the next room and you see a bed that looks like that. Well, does that mean it's elevated? Or what if it's this? Is that <laughs> elevated? So you might consider elevated to mean one thing and your colleague might consider something totally different. So suddenly our data is not very useful. So that's why we need to go about doing step three, which is creating an operational definition. It's really the how-to of data collection. It provides clarity on what we're going to measure as well as what we will not be measuring. So in our example, it would have told us an elevated bed is between 25 and 45 degrees or something like that, and then we know exactly what we're measuring. So operational definitions can be pretty simple, but there are some key points to cover. So it's basically you need to figure out exactly what you're measuring. What are the numerator and what is the denominator? Is there anything being excluded from the data? Who will collect the data and how often? Where and how will we display that data? And where does that data come from? So you can do this kind of however you want. If you want to make it on a Microsoft Word, fine. If you want to do it on Excel, it's fine. It's whatever works for you. But if you want to get really in-depth and have a very thorough operational definition, there is a provincial template that's available on SharePoint that will cover all of these points. So if you've created a good operational definition, the next thing you can start doing is create a data collection plan. But this, to be fair, these two steps aren't normally really separated. They're usually sort of intertwined. That The discussion of creating an operational defin definition will have the same discussion of data collection plan because they work so much together. Making a data collection plan really involves determining how the data is going to be collected, how the data will be analyzed and shared, and how it will be isn't depth as possible. There's pretty much no room for you can make it the better your data is going to be. Doug, it's really hard to hear you. Yeah. If I send feedback again on the line there, I don't know if, if everyone could just take a moment to ensure that they've pressed star six to mute their phone. And it seems to be noise from a call, a line that's in a bigger room, because we can hear a lot of background noise in terms of like a busy place or something. <laughs> so if you're calling in from a busy place, it might be you. Does everyone hit star six? And I'm going to take a stab and guess it might be you, because when you spoke earlier, I could hear the background noise when you spoke. Did you hit star six on your phone? Dan, are you there? Is there anyone from Ships on the line? Hey, there you go. Oh, perfect. Hopefully you can all hear me now just a little bit better. So when you're starting to figure out what you're going to collect for data, there's some questions that you should be able to answer. So it's, the first is, who's going to actually collect the data? And a big, sort of a tip for this is to stick to a position, not a person. So instead of saying, John is going to collect this every Tuesday, say, the executive assistant will collect this every Tuesday. That way, if there's coverage, it's clear what position is doing and it doesn't fall through the cracks. Uh, you also need to know when the data is going to be collected and try and be as specific as possible about the day, the time, the frequency. You need to know how it's going to be collected. So is it going to be part of a process that exists, or do you need to create something that might help with the collection? And really, the easier you can keep it, the better. Uh, you need to look at what will be included in the data. Are you excluding anything? And finally, who will be responsible for analyzing the data? And where will it be displayed? So going back to my hockey example, here's what I'm thinking through for what my operational definition and data collection plan might look like. And I've amalgamated it into one. So what am I measuring? This, this will be the operational definition for my goals scored. So I'm going to measure the number of goals scored per season for me. Numerator and denominator? Numerator, number of goals scored in the season. Denominator, number of games in the season. Is anything being excluded from the data? Well, I'm going to exclude goals that are scored that aren't in the ASHL games. So if I went out and played shitty, I'm not going to count that. Who's going to collect the data? Well, the data is going to be collected by the timekeepers at the game. How will we display it? It's displayed on the ASHL website and in this presentation, I suppose. 
And where does the data come from? It comes from the scorekeeper at those games. So there's a very basic one that would cover what I'm looking at. I could get a lot more in depth if I wanted to, but that covers the gist of it. So it's not too uncommon to hear that people don't want to collect data, that people don't want to collect data because it's too much work or it's a hassle to do. But I really do think that a good data collection plan can help with that. So my first hint is to think if it's possible to build the data collection process into an existing process. So for example, in our mistake proofing project, we were commonly using a database to track interactions with mental health and addiction patients. So we built a pretty simple drop down menu right into that database so that we could collect the data we needed. This falls into the keeping it simple. That database was being used for every single patient, so it was pretty easy for the staff to tick off one more thing before they closed the entry. One other really big thing about data collection is to keep it simple and to keep communicating it. Show why it's going to be useful and then show how it's going to be used. Because I think in all of our experiences, it, people are much more likely to be engaged and collect the data if they can see what it is you're working towards. So step five, it's simple. So just go do it. So unlike when we started this section, we now have a plan of how to collect data and we know how we're going to do it so we can start. So don't be like this guy. Don't say, yeah, I'll get to it, or oh, I want to improve the plan a little bit. It's okay to start and then just check back on the process and make modifications. It's about starting something that's really just good enough to go instead of waiting for it to be perfect. You don't need to wait for lots of data to start having conversations about the process either. Something I heard earlier this week was if you've got a dot, you can plot. Even if you've got one or two dots, you can start having that conversation because that data might be telling you something. So here's my data. It's been collected by the staff of the Adult Safe Hockey League. And thankfully they do it because there's no way I want to deal with doing that during a game. <laughs> so that's the end of the second section. Are there any questions or sort of feedback at this point or learnings that people would like to share on the line? You can start six to unmute. <laughs> we have permission. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we want noise on the other end. <laughs> Okay, well with that I'm gonna, gonna keep it on moving, but if you do have questions, feel free to, to ask. I'll be happy to stop and see if we can do our best to answer them. So we're on to the third section, and it's the final section. And this is the one about using the data for improvement. So there's only three steps left, left, we're on step six of eight. So for lots of people, this can be the most difficult step, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be complicated. Really, it, the easier it is to understand the data and present it, the better. So there's lots of different things you can do to analyze data. You could create a chart, you might want to create a table, you could use a map. Maps are really good in hot spotting or in root cause analysis. Like for example, if you are working in a primary care clinic and you want to look at falls, if you had a map of the clinic, you could put on there where every fall had happened. Perhaps you see a pattern, maybe you could look into some root cause if there's something you could figure out and work on. Another way is to think of a new method of showcasing stuff, so something that was new to me since I became part of the healthcare world was a safety cross or a safety calendar. So here's a couple examples of way data can be explained or displayed. So this is a chart that shows the number, the weights for surgery in the province basically. And it's a pretty clear chart. You can see that the wait time is going down. However, there's actually lots of room for improvement in this chart. It's kind of busy and it's kind of cluttered. And unless you really look at it, you might not know that Saskatoon is purple and Regina is green. So there's still lots of room for improvement, which is good because we always want to be continuously improving. There's this, and I really like this example actually because the first time I looked at it, I had no idea what they were measuring, but it was really clear to me that from one month to the next, there was a really big change in whatever it was. I found out now that it, they were looking at sick time and overtime, so whatever they process they implemented from one month to the next, you can see there was a really big change. But I mean, this is about making it visual and really simple to understand at a glance. So that's why I like that one so much. Here's that safety cross. So it's pretty clear to see that on the 11th, there was a safety issue. Again, keeping it simple, keep it basic, but make it visual. So just to bring us back to what my budding hockey career looks like, here's the measurement framework that we decided upon earlier in the presentation, just so you've got that in your mind as we move forward. So when I'm gonna start looking at analyzing my data, there's four different categories of charts that I can choose from. You could, I could look at a chart for comparison. I could look at a chart that might show relationships. I could look at a chart to show distribution. 
or I could look at a chart that might show composition. So the first of these categories that I'm going to look at is the charts for comparison. And I'm choosing this one to start with because these are the types of charts that are used for data for improvement, and that's why I think they're most important to this group. So one type of chart for comparison, it's the bar chart, and it's used to show comparisons between categories. So with that in mind, I tried to create a bar chart that showed my goals and assists over time. Now, you're looking at this, and I mean it's a chart, and I think the chart kind of works, but at first glance, it's really not that easy to tell what's going on. So I would say this isn't actually the kind of chart that I want to use. And I think that's an important thing to note, is just because you can make a chart out of the data you have, it might not be the best way to display it. So in this instance, a bar, isn't, bar chart isn't great, and that's not what I'm going to use. However, in this example, which I stole from an RPIW that I worked on, um, our co-lead created a bar chart that showed the number of C-section deliveries by day of the week. It was very simple, it's easy to understand, and it shows pretty clearly that on Monday and Thursday there's more C-sections. So a bar chart can be a pretty useful tool depending on what you're displaying. So once I determined that my bar chart wasn't going to work, I thought I'd go back to my measurements and say, okay, well, what can I do to show my outcome measure and determine if my improvement efforts that I've been putting into making myself a better hockey player are actually working? So since my outcome measure is total points, my pretty obvious thought is to make a chart that shows my total points each season. So to do that, I created a line chart. So at first glance, it looks like there hasn't been a lot of improvement and the data appears to be pretty random. But because I have the background knowledge and I'm kind of an expert in the data, I'm aware that the low point that was in the fall of 2013 only had six games, whereas the high point in fall and winter of 2014 had 30 games. So because of this lack of denominator on this graph, it makes the data pretty misleading, so I wouldn't want to use it. So with that knowledge in hand, I'm going back to what my initial thoughts were on what I could measure, and I'm going to retweak them. So my total points, I think I want to actually make that into points per game. That way it makes it a little more relevant for me. And I'm going to change the rest of my measures to modify and have a denominator showing on them. That makes it very clear what I'm going to measure. So my new outcome measure is points per game, and here's the chart that I created. So this looks a lot different than that last line chart. It's clear to see that there has actually been some improvement in the recent seasons. However, what might make this chart even better would be to include a median. This creates a bit of a divide between the data, and it's helpful in using data for improvement. Adding the median turns my line chart into a run chart. And the run chart, in most people's opinion, and mine included, is one of the most useful charts in data for improvement. So there's a set of run chart rules that can be used to help signal if there's been a change in the data, and it can help show you if your process is improving. So this is something we could delve into in a future session, but I won't be getting too far into it at the moment. So this next slide builds upon the run chart to make it even more useful. What I've done is I've added a target to my chart. So that came directly out of my goal statement. And if you remember, my goal statement was to improve by 10% over last season. So my last full season was the spring and summer of 2015, and as such, I set my goal 10% higher than that. So as you can see, so far through this season, I'm not meeting my goal, so there's still some room for improvement. So here's a look at a run chart that shows the number of residents who fell in long-term care in Cyprus. And this is just a healthcare example of how a run chart can be useful. It's easy to see, it's easy to understand, it looks like there may have been a shift to less falls, and they're meeting their target, because that shaded area is their target area. So why is it that run charts are so important? Well, it's because they show data over time. They make the performance of the process visible, and they can be kept very close to real time so that the data is useful and it can be talked about. If they show that if improvement has been made, and they, even more importantly, they'll show if it's been sustained. Now, my next example, which I'm going to run through pretty quickly just because we're getting shorter on time, but I do want to cover it. So it's an example that shows how run charts can be more telling than a simple before and after measurement. So if we're going to look at this first graph that's on the screen, it shows us that we're measuring delay time. And before we did a change, our delay time was eight hours. After we made a change, our delay time was three hours. So it looks like we made some pretty good improvement. But here's how that data might look if it was actually displayed on a run chart and we'd taken more measurements. We can see that the data is actually pretty random and perhaps there was no improvement at all. We just measured our baseline on a week when it happened to be high and we measured our after on a week when it happened to be low. That's why data over time is so important. 
I'm going to skip past this slide in the interest of, interest of time. So another thing I want to mention about run charts is that, that they can also be used in conjunction with other types of charts. So for instance, if you remember that safety cross that I showed you earlier, we could turn that into a run chart at the end of every month. We might take the number of incidents and plot it on a run chart so that we could notice if there was a big spike. That might lead us to doing some root cause analysis to determine why that happened that month. The second kind of category that I could use for displaying data is charts that show relationships. And usually these are used to determine if one thing is affected by another. So for example, if I'm doing work in a primary healthcare clinic and I want to look at falls prevention, I might want to plot the falls against staff vacancies to see if there's a correlation between the number of staff on and the number of people that fall. I might get a chart that looks like this. So it shows pretty clearly that the more staff that are working, the less falls that there are. And that's how you can use a scatter chart. So again, back to linking this to my budding hockey career, I'm thinking about how I'd like to evaluate my balancing measure. So it seems like a chart for comparison would work pretty well. So I chose to plot the number of nights that I spent on the couch because my lovely girlfriend didn't want me to wake her up when I got home or because she was mad that I spent the night at the rink instead of with her. So when I get a chart that looks like that, it appears to show a pretty strong correlation between the number of nights that I sleep on the couch and the number of nights that I spend playing hockey. So in this case, it kind of signals to me that I need to find a pretty reasonable balance between playing hockey and spending time at home so that everyone's happy. And I would want to keep track of this balancing measure against my points to ensure that I'm not spending so much time trying to improve one thing that I'm starting to affect other things. The third category of charts is that I would use for analysis is charts that show distribution. So for this crowd, I'd say the chart that's the most useful is the Pareto diagram. So the Pareto diagram is essentially a bar chart that's been arranged, arranged so that the item with the number, the highest number of occurrences is plotted first and so on. So when I'm playing hockey, it's particularly difficult to get any points if I'm sitting in the penalty box. So in order to improve my scoring, it makes sense to me to try and reduce the amount of penalties that I take. So in order to analyze the amount of penalties that I take, it seems like a Pareto diagram would be a pretty good choice. And this is because it'll show me what my most common issues are, and it will break down my tendencies. So here's the Pareto diagram of penalties that I've taken over the years. So what this shows me, I mean, besides the fact that I've taken way too many penalties, <laughs> is that if I focus on not slashing people, I would make a big impact on my time wasted in the penalty box. Another thing I could do is take this one step farther. And if I wanted to highlight all of the penalties I take because of my stick, like this, I could decide that perhaps I need to control that stick a little bit, bit better, and maybe my temper as well. So predator diagrams are useful in healthcare, especially because they show where you can get the biggest bang for your buck. So instead of tackling everything, you can focus on one area or one item or one issue that can be selected and focused, focused on. And this is extremely useful in mistake proofing. So like I mentioned, I was in a mistake proofing project and we just wrapped it up and the chart at the bottom is from that project. We used it to show where we should start our PDCAs. We wanted to tackle that first area. So that's what I would recommend using Pareto diagrams for, is figuring out where you can start. So the last category of charts that can be used to analyze data are charts which show composition. So the one everyone is probably most familiar with is the pie chart. So it shows the proportion of different items that make up the whole. So for example, if you want to look at the reason people might come into emergency to the emergency department, a pie chart could be pretty useful for showing the breakdown of reasons. So you can show trauma, illness, or appointments. The other type of charts that can be used to show composition are stack bar charts and percent load charts. And it seems like most people don't really like percent load charts, but kind of a fun fact, they're just a stacked bar chart. And really, they're just another way of looking at a pie chart. If you took a pie chart and just stacked it all together, that's exactly what it is and that's what you're doing. So they don't have to be as intimidating as they might seem. So if you recall, when I first created, the first chart I created was a bar chart showing my goals and assists, but it wasn't really that useful. So what I've done now is I've turned that into a stacked bar chart. So I feel like this tells a much better story about the data. So the height of the column shows my total points per season and the breakdown within the column shows my goals and assists. And I think that tells a story that's much more easy to see at a first glance. 
Okay, so I know that was a whole lot of information, but we are almost done. There's only a couple of steps left, and then we'll hopefully have a pretty good basis for using data for improvement. So step seven is about sharing the data that you've analyzed so that it can be discussed and used. I mean, really there's no point in collecting data if you're not going to use it. So sharing data is about making the progress visual. You can do this by incorporating it into daily visual management, or you can take it a step farther and think about who else might benefit from your data. Are there patient stakeholders that you want to share it with? Are there other units that could benefit? Are there other regions that could benefit? Could you put it on kaizantracker.ca so that other people can see the work you're doing and perhaps they can steal shamelessly? So when you're displaying data, it's pretty helpful to put it up and show the complete picture. Show the outcome, the process, and the balancing measures. So this helps as a conversation starter because there's several different charts that you can discuss and analyze. So now that you know the measurement framework, I would suggest that that's how you should display it. Have the outcome measure at the top, put the process measures below that, and put the balancing measures below that. This helps create that line of sight from the smaller projects that you're working on to your bigger outcome goal. So the final step in using data for improvement is to actually do something, it's to take action. If you've got a Pareto, does it highlight where you should focus your initial effort? If you've been working on a PDCA, have you noticed a shift in the data? Or have you noticed if your process has improved? Has your outcome measure shifted? So, I mean, really, if the PDCA did or did not create a change, there's still action to be undertaken. So if it did change, the action would be to try and sustain that process and keep measuring it over time to ensure that there's no slip. Or if it didn't work, you might want to analyze that PDCA and see what you learned and try again and keep measuring it. Use the data to plan your improvement activities. So here's a couple tips for doing PDCAs, and there will be a, a fuller discussion of this in the next fall learning series. But really, it's try one PDCA at a time. Implement it for a specific amount of time and collect data. Analyze that data to see if it resulted in any change. Based on what you learned, develop the next one and continuously improve like that. So that's the pretty quick overview of how to use data for improvement. But just to sort of cover it one more time, here's a quick recap of the basics of each step. So first, determining what to measure, you need to understand the problem. So know your PQA, know your patient experience, know your staff issues. Make a goal statement. Remember to use that SMART statement. So keep it specific, measurable, aspirational, relevant, and timely. Determine what you can measure to help you meet your goal. Try and involve everyone you can in this and think through outcome process and balancing measures. When you're collecting data, create an operational definition and be specific about it. Determine a data collection plan, the who, what, where, when, and how. And then actually just go do it, start. Using data for improvement, keep it simple. Simpler, the better. Use data to determine what to tackle. It really doesn't matter what type of chart you use. Use what's most relevant to you. Use what makes the most sense to tell your story. And then begin one PDCA and evaluate the results. Use that to continuously improve. So are there any questions at this point as we're starting to wrap up or anything that people on the line would like to give as feedback or their experiences? Did Sherry Furness find that cat picture for you? No, I found that cat picture <laughs> for Sherry Furness. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, Chanel here from Prairie North. Um, that was a really useful um, data and measurement um, presentation. Thank you so much, Doug. Thanks. I appreciate that. Hi, Doug. It's Kathleen from eHealth. I have a Hi, Kathleen. My question may be um, out of scope of this presentation, but and I concur with Chanel, I really enjoyed it, and I hope you're going to share the slide deck with all of us. Um, so a lot of times we have, as, as you commented, you need to determine what you can measure. I guess my question is, when do you make a decision to not just go with the measures that are available, but actually measure what you really need to measure to, under, to address the problem? Does that make sense, or am I... <laughs> So I guess for me, like a lot of times, you know, in the early days and working on the provincial measures, we have a lot of data that we collect for CAHA and other reasons, et cetera. But they aren't necessarily the data that we really want to really understand if we solved a problem. So when do you decide to create a more a, a different data collection system? And um, I don't know. I, Sorry, I guess my question's not really well formulated. I apologize. No, it's a really good question, Kathleen. It's Tanya. I think what you're getting at is feasibility and um, 
you know, at a, at a macro system level or a provincial level, that's a bigger undertaking than it would be, say, at a frontline unit level where you're debating, you know, here's some existing data I may have, but actually I'd rather be able to collect some data, you know, ourselves because it's not, the existing data isn't going to hit the mark. So, you know, as you scale up to a provincial level, the feasibility and the cost certainly uh, are more of a factor. Um, but, I, you know, I think what you raise is an important point, and I had talked to Doug about this earlier this week around goal setting, because often what will happen is people will shy away from creating or setting a goal that they really need to set because they realize they can't measure it. And right. that's not the right approach because truly you should be setting your goal as to what you really want to achieve, and you've got to figure out how we're going to collect that data that's going to tell us. And sometimes what that means is you're maybe looking at three different types of measures or what I would call more proxy measures. They might not get exactly at that goal, but they will give you enough kind of a triangulation of information that helps you understand uh, progress. So I don't know, Rosemary, if you want to add something to that, but... Oh, thanks. I think that's in fewer words than I could have used. So. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hi, it's Erin Christians from Kelsey Trail here. I had a question that was uh, on the similar lines, and you know, it's uh, you touched on a really good point about understanding the the whys. And I'm finding in some areas, if they don't have you know good value stream mapping um, or daily visual management, they're struggling to get the whys out. And I find some things are being measured, and when I ask why are you measuring that, they say, well, because the ministry wants us to rather than it driving their daily continuous improvement and being meaningful to the staff. So I'm just, I, that was um, one comment, I guess, that I have, because I don't think we'll we'll solve it today, but I think it's something that we need to consider. But I do have a specific question for you, Doug, around, um, is there a way, you know, a, it was an awesome presentation, um, but is there any way that you or anybody else on the line can recommend creating things like run charts or any charts with with people who have really minimal experience uh, with something like Excel? Yeah, I think what we're looking at doing, I mean, there's basic recommendations of the first thing I would say is just Google it and there's great steps out there. But what we're looking at doing for a future fall learning series or a mid-winter learning series <laughs> is to actually do one on run charts. So we would sort of delve into the, the rules for doing them and how to make them and I think that would be valuable. But if you want to just get started and do some basics, it would be I mean, they could contact anyone here and we'd be happy to help them or, I mean, really there's great resources out there, so. And Erin, we have a lot of existing stuff left over from releasing time to care with measurement coordinators. We created some templates with Excel and how to, you know, pre-populate so you just plug your data in and it creates uh, at least a line chart and then it talks you through how to create your median um, based on each data point that you add. So we could talk offline about that. And then, of course, we could highlight it in that mid-winter <laughs> series. And just to your earlier point, I wanted to reinforce for folks that, um, you know, it's really important that you think about what question you have before you start to think about what data you need to collect. And um, oftentimes when we're trying to identify a problem, that's usually through existing data. But as we move forward, say, trying to understand more fully what the problem is, you're collecting possibly new data to help you understand. And then if you move forward past that, where you're actually doing improvement work, you might create a whole measurement framework that's completely different from that original data that, that kind of showed you the problem in the first place. So just kind of think about that piece as well, because at, at different parts of the process, you're going to have different questions, and that's going to help you figure out, okay, what, what data, what information am I actually looking for? Hi there. This is Leanne from SHIPS again. Um, I just wanted to make a comment that um, I think we can all agree that there are a lot of measures or data that are currently being collected and, and for purposes, whether provincially or national comparators like the CHI-HI data. Um, I think it's important to understand the, the reason why that information is available at that level. Like, for instance, CHI-HI are really system-level outcomes for national and provincial comparative reporting purposes, and they are in place because there are standards um, by which everybody that submits data um, apply 
to the data collection and submission so we can compare apples to apples. And that doesn't necessarily um, get down to what measures are needed um, at a process level when we're trying to specifically tackle a quality improvement effort within one of our regions or at one of our facilities. But I think if you talk to people in your, in your region that are familiar with the data and that have um, access to the record level information and can help you dig and sift through it, there's actually a lot of very, very valuable um, insights that can be gained from deeper dives into what is already out there. That's an excellent suggestion, Leanne, and I, I'm just reflecting on my RPIW experiences where, you know, through the initial steps of understanding PQA, I mean, I was opened up to a whole new world of what's actually existing in the regions in terms of data. So it's a very good place to start and not to dismiss that there might be some true treasures in there to help you understand. We had a question in the chat just wondering where the operational definition of templates might be located in the wonderful wilderness of share pipes. Sure. <laughs> uh, I can I can send out a link as part of the package I'll send out with this PowerPoint. I don't know exactly what the path is, but I know it's one click off the main pages. Don't remember exactly where I click. But as we're getting kind of short on time here, I think I'm just going to take the last couple minutes to sort of wrap wrap this up. So just so everyone knows, we're going to do a quick process check through a survey that HQC will be sending out. Um, so if there's any areas that you'd like to dig deeper into in the future, this would be a really good place to suggest it. Um, if you want some additional resources, here's what I would recommend. The top link is to a series of whiteboard presentations that are done by Bob Lloyd on the IHI website, and they cover a wide range of topics on measurement and using data for improvement, and they are a really, really good resource. Uh, the second item there is a book that that same Bob Lloyd wrote, and it's very in-depth, but it's a pretty good read. But what I do recommend is, that, is if you're going to read it, read it how I did it, which was on a patio in Italy with a cold apple juice, I suppose, if, <laughs> if that's appropriate. So it's a fantastic book, and if you want to get really into healthcare and using indicators, that's the book you should probably read. Again, feel free to contact me if you've got questions, and if I can't answer it, I'll find someone that will. So there's my contact info. And just so everyone knows, the next Fall Learning Series will be on October the 23rd, and it'll be all about PDCAs. So that's all I've got for the, the moment. Again, thank you for calling in and thank you for your feedback and for the discussion. And I appreciate it and have a good day. Where's the recording going to be found? That's a good question. We'll, yeah. we'll send a link probably as part of the package that goes out. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. You will be disconnected by the